We're up to part four of our conversation with Dire Straits co-founder and former guitarist David Knopfler. I'm John Bowden from Rock History Music. David Knopfler is the younger brother of Mark Knopfler, who's well known as being the leader of Dire Straits, but it wasn't always that way. In the beginning of their career, both of them were writing songs for the band. By the time their debut album came out in 1978, it was all Mark Knopfler. And with that combination in the band, well, David Knopfler left after the making of their third album. Remember, Dire Straits 78, Communicate 79, and Making Movies was in the process of being made when David had to leave. Here's our conversation. Uh, were you and your brother close growing up? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Especially, especially in the period um, leading up to the first Dire Straits album. That was definitely uh, the closest we ever. I know then, this is none of my business, but you know, you're it. right. But it was never, we were never as close, I don't think, as we were in 75 and 76 in that period heading up to the, to the, to the band. Mark was, in, Mark was in recovery at the time, though, from a, a, a failed marriage. And so he was very emotionally open at that time to, <laughs> to, to having a kid brother and tell him stuff. I don't think that was going to last. I mean, you know, Mark's a triple Leo and he was always going to, was always going to lead from the front and not, not always, not always with the, the grace and dignity that one would, would, one would like to see, you know, I, but he was young and success was really thrust upon us incredibly fast. I mean, there was some schlepping around. Sure. We opened for, we opened with a tour opening for talking heads when Mark and I were sharing a bedroom on tour, you know, but that didn't last that long. Pretty soon we were in five star hotels in Paris you know, wondering whether, you know, and people would say, what color ashtray would you like? You know, I mean, it was spoiled, rotten by the industry too. Expected to be prima donnas. I mean, that's kind of what happens. Your parents, what were your parents like? Good, uh, complicated, troubled, uh, a lot of words. My father was um, a refugee. So that takes you back to the first song on the album. Um, so I, I've always had a, a very strong understanding of how it feels to be an alien in a foreign land mm -hmm. and to feel alienated, as my father did and felt. So, I mean, he was an architect. He got a first-class honours degree in a foreign language, um, very bright, very capable, um, but with a, a difficult personality that was probably post-traumatic stress disorder from hiding, up, hiding in safe houses from the Nazis for years. And being a and being a very left wing activist, he was probably you know in illegal printing presses, fermenting revolution in the nineteen thirties. You know, so um, that was him, firebrand. There was never if he saw a good fight, he'd always get into it, and uh, <laughs> and sometimes on the back of a bus, if you heard a racist remark behind him, you know, he'd turn his head and he'd have it out with them, and the whole bus would hear about it. <laughs> I just wanted to, you know. <laughs> I was seven or something, you know, please don't embarrass me, dad. But of course he did every time. And later you come to admire him for it, you know, but at the time it wasn't always easy. And my, my mother was long suffering because of that, I think. And she was a quiet English woman who, who did, wanted respectability more than anything else. And Irwin wanted trouble <laughs> and found it, you know, time and time again. Um, I haven't, I haven't traveled that far away, as far away from you as I'd like to think. You know, a lot of me is still very quick to see it. See it. If I see it, something that's a problem, I'm not slow to come forward about it. Did they get your music, you and uh, Mark, when you guys were getting into music, did they get that? Because parents from that generation. No, not entirely, but, yeah. but it went but to, to his credit, Erwin went along with it. My dad, he, he, um, he bought Mark a, a, a Fender, uh, sorry, a Hofner Super Solid Red guitar, which was then 45 pounds. And for comparison, I think a Strat was then, a Fender Strat was about 160 and 45. So it was about a quarter of the price, but it, 45 pounds was a lot of money back then. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the Strats were just stratospherically impossible. We'd, we'd, we'd go past the shop window, noses pressed to it and look at them and just dream about it, you know, but we never could have one. Um, so the Hofner was still a step above the Rossettis, which were the cheaper ones, you know. So the Hofner, to have, he was quite the talk of the town whilst his friends having this guitar with two cutaways, you know, and looking 
looking red and looking like the real thing. And whenever he went out with his friends, I snuck it out from under his bed and played it. I learned to play House of the Rising Sun in it when I was 11, you know, when he was 14 or 15, maybe I was 11 or 12. And uh, so I played it all the time. He never knew, but every time he wasn't there, it, would be, it was out and played. I was never allowed to play it, but every, I did endlessly. And I had a little Tommy Steele guitar as well that I played. But yeah, so my parents, they, they were tolerant of it. They let me have a drum kit when I was 11 or 12. And the neighbours at the opposite end, opposite far end of the road could hear that 50 houses down. I mean, it was shocking what it must have inflicted on people. But I was allowed to practice, and, you know, and we were in bands and we did all the things that teenage musicians do. Um, we were both quite precocious, really playing in folk clubs and playing in rock bands. And I formed a rock band where I was the drummer, but I was better than the guitarist as a player. So in the end, it was, I had to switch, you know. <laughs> I was never very good as a drummer, to be honest. I didn't even know how to tune a drum kit. It was half the trouble. I didn't know what you was putting. You, nowadays, you go on Google. You know, you don't want to, you want to know something. Then it was sacred and everything was sacred, secret knowledge. And nobody shared. Nobody told you. you no internet. Talking. Yeah. There was no internet and there was no phones even, you know, you want to meet a friend, you went down the road and hoped they might be there. <laughs> That's nothing, you know, 